Keep me safe, O God, for in you I take refuge. I said to the Lord, you are my Lord. Apart from you I have no good thing. As for the saints who are in the land, they are the glorious ones in whom is all my delight. The sorrows of those will increase who run after other gods. I will not pour out their libations of blood or take up their names on my lips. Lord, you have assigned me my portion and my cup. You have made my lot secure. The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Surely I have a delightful inheritance. I will praise the Lord who counsels me. Even at night my heart instructs me. I have set the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest secure. Because you will not abandon me to the grave, nor will you let your Holy One see decay. You have made known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. Lord, in the name of Yeshua, the name above all names, we bend the knees of our heart to you, Lord, this night. We worship you, O God. We ask for that anointing that breaks every yoke to fall upon each and every person that's here, Father God. Give them ears to hear and hearts to receive what you would have this night. Father, pour out your spirit, a spirit of wisdom and truth on this place, Lord God, that all who hear your voice, all who hear your words, will be transformed into the likeness of our Messiah. Let your light shine within us, Lord, that man would see our good works and bring glory to you, O God. Abba, we thank you for this night. We know you delight in your Shabbat. We ask for your blessing for your covering, for your outpouring this night as we dedicate this message to you, Lord God. In the name of Yeshua, amen and amen. You may be seated. Well, Shabbat Shalom, y'all, and a special shalom to our podcast listeners and those who download our sermons from www.shalombirmingham.com. We're week six of a 12-part series on the Ten Commandments, a series that has challenged us to rethink many things we've been taught and open our hearts and minds to the Word of God. Many of us have opened our minds to the teachings of man, but have closed our ears to the teachings of God. Let all men be liars, but let God be true. As believers in the New Covenant promises, there's often a struggle as to what, if anything, we're required to keep under the Mosaic Covenant. Again, I tell you that the Ten Commandments are not separate from the 613. Their distinction is only that they were written by the finger of God on tablets of stone, and the remaining 603 were written down as Moses was commanded by God. But the 10 cannot be separated from the 613. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 says, All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Tonight, as we look at the fifth commandment, I'm reminded of a story about honoring our parents. Three elderly women were sitting at the Jewish home in San Francisco. They were overheard were three mothers bragging about their relationships with their sons. While the first one began, my son is so devoted to me, for my birthday he gave me an all-expense-paid cruise around the world. The second one pipes in and says, that's nothing. Mine threw a huge cater affair for me, and he flew in my, all my friends from the east. The third woman smirked at them both, and without a doubt, my son is the most devoted, she said. Three times a week, he goes to his therapist. $130 a session he pays, and what does he talk about me about the whole time? Me. (laughs) And I'm sure you're all aware of that old parenting adage, there are three ways to get something done. One, to do it yourself. Two, to hire someone to do it. Or three, forbid your children from doing it. (laughs) Tonight we look at that fifth commandment. We begin to see the second part of the Ten Commandments containing instruction for life. Remember, the first four commandments were about our relationship with God. And that fourth commandment, honor the Sabbath and keep it holy, was the cross piece. To give us rest, to restore our relationship with God and receive from Him. But also to prepare us for how to interact with each other. The fifth commandment is the beginning of that instruction about that life that we must live with each other. 
How fitting that it would begin in the home as life is brought into the home and mother and father are charged with training up a child in the way they should go. Instruction begins at home. Exodus chapter 20 verse 12 tells us to honor your father and your mother so that you may live long in the land your God is, the Lord your God has given you. Exodus 21.15 says anyone who attacks his father or his mother must be put to death. Exodus 21.17, anyone who curses his father or mother must be put to death. Leviticus 19.1-3, through 3, the Lord said to Moses, speak to the entire assembly of Israel and say to them, be holy because I, the Lord your God, am holy. Each of you must respect his mother and father and you must observe my Sabbaths. I am the Lord your God. Leviticus 20 and 9, anyone, if anyone curses his father or mother, he must be put to death. He has cursed his father or his mother, and his blood will be on his own head. Deuteronomy 5, 16, honor your father and your mother as the Lord your God has commanded you so that you may live long and that it may go well with you in the land the Lord your God is giving you. The Torah is rich with instruction. The Torah is rich with wisdom. The Torah contains a pattern of blessings. The Torah and all 613 of the commandments are part of the Mosaic Covenant. The big question is, does this apply to us? We understand from Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34, the time is coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their forefathers when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt because they broke my covenant, though I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law on their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will a man teach his neighbor or a man his brother saying, Know the Lord, because they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. Over the past five weeks, we've shared that what's hidden in the Ten Commandments is revealed in the Brit Hadashah. And what the Ten Commandments showed us was not nullified in the New Covenant, not nullified, but clarified. We understand the clarification and the illumination of what these Ten Commandments are about. And the ones that made it from the Old Covenant, from the Tanakh into the New Covenant, as God incorporates and weaves into the fabric of His Word the blessings of the wisdom and much of the instruction of Torah. We come expectantly now because we know that the New Covenant, the Brit Hadashah, contains insight and illumination, not nullification but clarification. So what does it say about the fifth commandment? Matthew 15, 1 through 9 tells us, Then some Pharisees and teachers of the law came to Yeshua from Jerusalem and asked, Why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? They don't wash their hands before they eat. Yeshua replied, and why do you break the command of God for the sake of your tradition? For God said, honor your father and mother, and anyone who curses his father or mother must be put to death. But you say that if a man says to his father or mother, whatever help you might otherwise have received from me as a gift devoted to God, he is not to honor his father with it. Thus you nullify the word of God for the sake of your tradition, you hypocrites. Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are but rules taught by men. Messiah stood against tradition for the sake of tradition. That if it didn't illuminate the Word of God, then it was just an idle tradition. I-D-L-E and I-D-O-L. And when we understand that we began to worship tradition over the truth of the Word of God, that we stopped reading our Bibles and we began to adopt the traditions of man. In the second temple time, you were committing korban. You were taking monies devoted to the temple and would not use them for the support of your family. And he said, clearly you do not honor your mother and father because money you've committed, money you've bought that seat in the front row, money that made you stand in front of other people, that gave you the best seat in the house, you should be taking care of your mother and father, but you don't honor them, you honor the temple. But honor begins at home. Honor begins at home. 
Ephesians 6, 2 and 3 says, Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy long life on earth. Colossians 3, 20 says, Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. I look around the room and I see many of you are children. Yes, all of you are children. All of you have a mother and father. Whether they're here or they've gone on to be with the Lord or maybe you don't know their whereabouts, you're still called to honor your mother and your father that it may go well with you in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5 kind of gives us another view of this. He says, but mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure, rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying its power. The admonition of God is saying, have nothing to do with them. Honor. Honor is a form of respect. Honor is a form of edification. Honor acknowledges that there is a Father in heaven, and when you dishonor your Father on earth, you bring shame to the name of the Lord because you've dishonored what He ordained. If God knew you before you were in your mother's womb, then He had a purpose for this person to be your father, and He had a purpose for this man, this woman to be your mother. And there's a reason in heaven for each and every gift of who our parents are, whether they're adopted or natural born. God had a plan. And He placed you and trusted you as a steward for those children you have, but for you to honor your mother and father. You should glean from them the wisdom. Your mother carried you for 10 months, for 40 weeks then took care of you and nurtured you when you could not feed yourself, you were fed. When you could not clothe yourself, you were clothed. When you could not change yourself, they changed you. They served your every need. They were your life support system. Yet as soon as we begin to think, we dishonor them. The Word of God tells us that knowledge puffs up. That all man's ways seem right to him. This is what happened to our children. We want to know why we've got to ask Adam who had a relationship with his father yet chose another way. What is it that's so tempting that causes us to disregard the instruction of our parents? Mark Twain said that after he turned about 25 years old, his kids thought he was, uh, after his kids turned 25, he thought, his kids thought that he had gone to night school because he began to get smarter and smarter as the years went by. Isn't this the way of our children that maybe from age 16 to 23, while they still know everything, they should go out and get a job and begin to contribute to their own education. And maybe when they come to the realization they don't have all the answers, they begin to come back knocking on the door and saying, Mom and Dad, what do you think of this? Honor your mother and father that it might go well with you. The first commandment with a promise and the promise of God is this, as we bring many of us as our parents age, we're to collect and harvest honor for them. That if we're the ones to bring their last message, to bring a testimony to their life, what honor will we bring their life in the reflection of us? Are we a reflection of honor? Are we a reflection of dignity and respect? Do we bring a good report to our name and our name's sake? If you're a man, you carry the name of your father, the last name of your father. In the Hebrew, you're named as Ben, son of your father's name. I'm Avraham Mendel Ber Ben Hirsch, son of Herschel. And to bring honor to the name Herschel, I must be a man of honor. I must bring honor to my family, not shame to my family. I must walk in the ways of righteousness or else I bring shame to the family name. How many suffer with a child who is in prison or has chosen a different path and it brings heaviness onto every member of the family? But yet it's never too late. God always has a plan. 
And God's timing is perfect. And God will use all the circumstances of our life that if we take the wisdom and the knowledge <clears throat> of honoring our mother and father, we'll find a way to harvest all the good and let go of all the bad. In Luke chapter 15, Yeshua told this pretty amazing story. There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set out for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to the field to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired men have food to spare? And here I am, starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired men. So he got up and went to his father, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, quick bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate, for the son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, so they began to celebrate. A son who paid the greatest disrespect to his father when he said to him, I wish you were dead. Give me what it is that you will give me upon your death. Now I wish you were dead that I might have what is owed to me and what is due to me. I wish you were dead. How many have thought that or uttered that with their lips as a child or maybe heard your children say that to you? It's the highest form of disrespect, yet Yeshua shows us. Shows us in this story that when the son dishonored his father, yes, he received a blessing of great wealth, but he squandered it. And in his disobedience brought shame upon himself. He became in need, for there was no blessing as the promise of God was honor your mother and father that it might go well for you. And it did not go well for him because he dishonored and he disrespected his father. In every bit of understanding, he said, Father, I wish you were dead. Give me what you would give me upon your death. Give it to me now that I might go my own way. And he went out and he brought shame to the name. It's an impassioned story of a love of a father who regardless of the behavior of his son, that in spite of what his son did, the father rejoiced and ran out to meet him. For the love of a parent for a child is never ending. It's not conditional upon the behavior of the child. It's a gift from God. And a parent's love for their child is unending and unceasing. And as we intercede for our children, we must maintain that hope that one day they will turn and return. How many of you understand this story in regards to your life? Because God sent Yeshua to run out to us. That the Father in heaven who we have not honored... We have not brought glory to the name of God. We have profaned His name. We have turned to our own ways. We've abandoned the traditions of God and replaced them with the traditions of man. We've stopped walking in His ways and stopped walking in His blessings. And we have not honored our Father in heaven. And for many, it is not going well for you. But God sent Yeshua to run out ahead he sent His only Son that might meet us in our condition. And as the old song says, I was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. I'm dead, but in Messiah I'm alive. For God's plans trump all man's plans. And God's plans are perfect. 
And God will use every circumstance in our life to drive us back to Him. If we've left ourselves to our own devices, if we thought our own way was the best way, God's going to remind us that His ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. But He's given us this instruction. And He showed us this perfect picture of a father and a son relationship and said it wasn't conditional upon the son's behavior. It wasn't a matter of the son rejecting the father. The father always accepted the son and waited patiently for the son to return. The son came to an end of himself because he was there in judgment. He was there in discipline for dishonoring and disrespecting his father and saying to him, in no uncertain terms, I wish you were dead. But God shows us a perfect picture of our lives. As we're left to our own ideas and our own strategies of life, we're solving our problems, we're handling our needs, but we only run to God the vending machine when we have a perfect need, when we have something too big for us, and then we'll get on our knees and pray. But in everyday life, we don't honor the Father. God doesn't want us to do more for Him. For what can you do for the one that owns a cattle on a thousand hills? What can you do for God that God can't do for Himself? Accept, accept spend time with Him. And accept His plan. As He sent Messiah to run into the world for each one of us that we might be redeemed. They were reminded that the Father's love is never ending. The Father's love is never ceasing. And whether we honor Him or we dishonor Him, He's waiting for us with open arms that He wants us to run to Him. Run to Him with our cares and our concerns and give our life to Him that we might surrender what we have and all of our ideas so that we bring honor to the Father in heaven. The fifth commandment. Honor your mother and father. Respect them. Bring honor to their name through the witness you are as the namesake of your mother and your father. That as you are sons and daughters of the kingdom of heaven, that you would bring honor and glory to your father in heaven. That you would remember that this commandment is not only an earthly commandment, it's a supernatural commandment for God calling us to honor him. To honor him with our praises to honor Him with our worship, to honor Him with our tithes and offerings, to honor Him with our surrender of our ways so that we might adopt His ways. That many of us that were not a person, not a people, can now become sons and daughters. And as sons and daughters, we're to give respect to the one who is due respect. Romans 13 tells us, as Paul wrote, Give respect to those that are due respect. And if you dishonor the authority that God's appointed, you bring judgment on yourself. God appointed your mother and father as your parents. And instead of looking at them and thinking how foolish they are, we need to honor them. We need to harvest from them the wisdom that they imparted to us many years ago. To remember the lessons that they gave us. And if they weren't a loving parent, maybe they're the very reason you sought God and ran after Him. And maybe instead of cursing them, you need to thank them. For they made it difficult on, for you on earth that you might run into the loving arms of the Father in heaven. And instead of a temporary gift of a pat on the head and a kind word, they ran you into the arms of the loving Father in heaven that you might have eternal life. No greater gift than that. Each of us is called to understand in our own lives how we are to honor our mother and fathers. Are we the prodigal son? Are we the one that we ask for the inheritance, we ask for the Messiah, we ask for the blessing, but we squander it. And we wind up broken, downtrodden. Or are we the one that doesn't know about our inheritance? Who doesn't know what's waiting for us in the kingdom of heaven? A father with open arms, 
who promises that he would never leave you or forsake you. He says, for I know the plans I have for you. They're plans for good and not for evil to give you a future and a hope. To understand that God so loved the world that He sent His only begotten Son, that whoever would believe in Him would not perish but have eternal life, meaning they can come to the throne of grace in the name of Yeshua, the name of Jesus, and receive from Him the blessings of heaven because we honor Him by accepting His plan, not ours. How many of you long to have that relationship with the Father in heaven? How many of you wonder how to achieve it, how to receive it? The story of the prodigal son is a perfect example of God who sent his Messiah, his son, to walk this earth that he might know the struggles that we have in everyday life, that he might see our pain. That sin abounds in a world, but yet the Father loves us so much that he's calling each one of us back by name. You may ask, how do I have this relationship with the Father? How do I say yes to this plan? How do I receive the inheritance from heaven without saying drop dead? You say yes to Yeshua, yes to Jesus. You say, how do I do that, Rabbi? You say a simple prayer. You say, Lord, I'm sorry that I've sinned against you. I'm sorry I've disrespected you. I'm sorry I did not honor you with my praises. I did not honor you with my worship. But Lord God, this night I honor you and I ask Yeshua, Jesus, into my heart and I believe he died for me. And on the third day he rose again and now he's sitting at your right hand, Father, interceding for me and because he lives, I can live tonight and forevermore. A father who loved the world so much that like Abraham, who was willing to put Isaac on the altar, God laid his son on a wooden cross, a wooden stake like the lamb in Exodus chapter 12, and provided a sacrifice for us that would finish the Mosaic system and bring access to the kingdom of heaven through the shed blood of one. If you're here tonight and you've never accepted Jesus, the promised Jewish Messiah, we call him Yeshua, that's the Hebrew word for salvation. If you've never accepted him before and you want to this night, just raise your hand and I'll say that prayer with you. Is there anyone here tonight that wants to say that prayer for the very first time? I'll say that prayer with you, that you might accept the Father's plan and bring honor to your Father in heaven. Is there anyone? Is there anyone? Stand to our feet. As many of you in this life that had hard parenting, as many of you had a difficult time relating to your mother or your father, when you give a description of them, it's in negative terms that they might have been harsh or heavy-handed. But tonight I want you to close your eyes and search your heart for the fulfillment of this fifth commandment. Look into your heart and see the person that you are today. Are you that person because of who they were? Are you strong in the Lord and in your faith because of who they were? Then you owe them a thank you. Are you strong in your understanding of who you are and your identity in Yeshua? Then you owe them a thank you for they gave you that gift to stand and be set apart. Maybe they didn't give you worldly possessions, but they gave you a heavenly possession that cannot fade. And cannot wither. And if you're here tonight and you want to forgive your mother and father, with every eye closed and everyone turning their eyes within, just slip your hand up. If it's time for you to forgive mom and dad, it's time for you to bring honor to their memory, it's time for you to respect them for giving you the gift of life, for taking care of you, for providing you with whatever education they did based on their circumstance and their abilities. And it's time to release them so that you can be free. For all of you that raised your hands and for those that didn't get your hand up, let us pray. Lord, in the name of Yeshua, we break the chains that bind us, Lord God, the bondage of unforgiveness towards our parents, Lord God, that we would become 
harvesters of the great fruit of the great harvest, Lord God, that you're bringing forth in our remembrance of our mothers and fathers. And we wash away the pain by placing it on the back of our Messiah who suffered for each and every one of us. Lord, we ask you this night to release us, Father God, to accept us and to accept our gift of forgiveness to our mothers and to our fathers, to our grandparents, to that uncle, to that relative, Lord God, to release them into your hands, Father God, that you might have your perfect way with them, wherever they might be. Father God, let us lift our hands to you and let them not be stained with a stain of resentment, but let them be inspected by you, Lord God, as we bring honor and reverence and respect to the names of our mothers and our fathers. Lord, this night I call for a perfect release, a release, as we lay them on your altar in the name of Yeshua. Amen and amen.